get started, so we have as much time for Q&A as possible. Uh, let me introduce you to Chuck Dowd, Music Director at Sony. Oh, am I on? <laughs> All right, so uh, it's probably pretty obvious to everybody what we're going to talk about today. We're going to break it down into uh, the music and the dialogue, I believe, and the sound effects for God of War. There's a lot to cover, so we're going we're gonna to kind of condense stuff down as, uh, as quickly as we can to make a lot of time for Q&A, because you know, I would imagine there would be some questions. Uh, we're going to start off talking about the music. Uh, Every once in a while, we get an opportunity to work on a title where it's, it's clear early on exactly what the music should be, uh, what style it is, what the role is, you know, how the music's going to be uh, implemented. And God of War was not that title. It, uh, <laughs> it wasn't anything close. Uh, looking back at it now, it's hard to imagine God of War sounding any different than it does. But uh, we basically had like an eight-month, which I affectionately call a pre-production period, where uh, we did a lot of uh, exploration, a lot of experimentation. I mean, our job as music supervisors is to really make the creative vision, in this case of Dave Jaffe, the game director, a reality. And uh, we, did, we did a lot of searching. And I don't think we would have ended up where we did if we didn't go down all those paths. But... Uh, during those eight months, you would have heard anything from like a heavy metal rock opera to something that was going in the Flash Gordon movie to uh, ambient industrial electronica. I mean, like all of the above. We actually had a lot of great music written for the game. And I think one of the lessons that we we kind of knew it, but it really became obvious and got a war. We we thought we settled on a style that was really creepy and dark and uh the music was just awesome. In fact, one of the composers, Ron Fish, who ended up, you know, doing some of the music for God of War, ended up composing some of this earlier music. But what we found out was, when we put it in context with the game, the game, it crushed the music. I mean, the game is, Kratos is so angry and there's so much rage. And we, we, we realized we needed some music that basically just had the balls and the meanness to actually hang out in the game and not get bowled over by everything. Uh which is what we ultimately ended up with. So when we went back to the drawing table, we had yet another round of composer submissions, and uh, we ended up with a, just a lot of great music, uh, which Clint is going to play for us in a couple of minutes. I think two quick lessons that, that I personally learned from this game were, uh, I mean, it really, did, it really takes a team to pull this kind of thing together. I mean, we had, uh, many of you know, we had a lot of composers working on the project, but there was also a lot of people working behind the scenes on our end and even with the developers, I mean, to really successfully get this music integrated into the game. I mean, Clint Bajakian did an, an amazing job of giving the composers uh, creative direction and taking all this wonderful music and really integrating it into the game. It almost broke him <laughs> with his first job at Sony, but, uh, but he did it and he's still around and we're happy. Uh, and I think another thing that we learn is uh, when we look at a game like God of War and a lot of games that we work on, we, we keep trying to evolve how we want the music to be. We want it to be more cinematic. And we have all these lofty ideas that we often put into practice about creating these elegant and intricate systems for having an adaptive score. And that stuff needs to be addressed on the front end with the composers, all the way through how they arrange it, how we end up reworking the multi-tracks. <clears throat> what we found for God of War was it didn't actually need that amount of sophistication. I mean, it just really needed some big, ballsy, visceral music in there hammering out. And that's not to say that the score doesn't adapt, because it does. And it does a lot of great stuff. But I think one <clears throat> a revelation that uh, Clint and I had about, unfortunately, about 75% through the project was when we sat down with Jaffe and we're, you know, showing him all the cool things we're doing. And he's like, guys, like, I want this game to sound like a B-movie. And we're like, Clint and I just looked at each other and our fa faces went pale. We're like, oh, my God. But ultimately, like, that dictated the approach that we took, right? And the music ended up being turned up to 11 <laughs> all the time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But it worked. And it needed to do that in order to survive in the game. So I think what I ended up walking away from that with is sometimes like a game just kind of needs to be scored 
as a game. And for lack of a better word, we almost had to, to kind of dumb down our approach for God of War because that's what the project needed. And ultimately, that's what made the music a success. Mm-hmm. And uh, I'm now going to hand it over to Mr. Clint Jakin. Thank you very much. Uh, dumbing it down is where I came in. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, what Chuck said, uh, some of that is really kind of some of, if it is true that God of War music was very successful, certainly the product overall is extremely successful, it, it's, it's kind of uh, gratifying how much it's due not to the sophistication of our implementation techniques uh, particularly, but really about the music itself and about um, getting the right music into the game at the right times and just sort of integrating it well, smoothing over transitions as best we can. We'll show you some techniques that we used. Um, I kind of feel a little bit like God of War is like a bucking bronco and the the musical score is kind of like the rodeo rider just, you know, holding on for dear life. Um, It's it's an incredible project and from a development standpoint, it kind of felt that that way too at times. Um, And I think... uh, the amount that we played the game and the amount that we immersed ourselves in, in the game and the project uh, and worked so closely with the composers and got such wonderful music in from the composers just all gelled. Basically, the aesthetic of the music is we're, we're in a Greek mythological world. It's very epic. It's huge. There's ferocious anger. There's monsters. There's war. Um, as Chuck mentioned, originally there was almost this concept of kind of a rock opera, which actually I think could have worked. Um, I, I once put uh, uh, Black Sabbath Iron Man behind some um, uh, gameplay of God of War, and it kind of worked. Um, but we ended up going with a kind of a big, boomy percussion uh, with a kind of ethnic Middle Eastern flavor. Um, we were determined, Chuck and I, not to have a wall-to-wall score, but rather to you know, let certain segments of gameplay just have sound design and kind of be immersive and treat the music a little bit more in a cue-based fashion. Um, the reason that's asterisk, oh, sorry, the reason that that's got an asterisk is because that was a fascinating uh, gradual development in working with David Jaffe is, in the beginning, he told us he wanted pretty much wall-to-wall, but we felt that we had a diplomatic developer service provider relationship, and we wanted to, you know, kind of convince him of the wisdom of having not wall-to-wall. Well, in the end, it, it had to be wall to wall. We should have just gotten it through our heads from the very beginning, and uh, because he dug his heels in and really wanted that to be the case, and that's sort of in sync with this B movie idea that we all remember the older days of video games, where music tended to be wall to wall. So what we did is is we we found ways to make the music breathe despite that. We originally thought of letting the action function as kind of the melodic element, like the, all the sword hits and the movements and the combo moves and the monster screams and everything that's just going on. It's, it's so frenetic that you can really kind of just put down a big, you know, vamp behind this thing and it just kind of works. You don't want to over stimulate the player with too much information. Um, again, that ended up, uh, Jaffe's exact words were, I mean, I effing hate this stuff that has no melody in it. I want melody. And so we were like, oh, oh okay, we've we got to rush and get some melody. Um, and we, we, it, was, it was a very spontaneous project. I think that's where the strength came from in the end, is we, we were deciding which cues we needed as we went. We learned something in this project that you don't... Um, don't uh, uh, pre-lock your cue lists going into a project. Don't like lock out, okay, we need 97 minutes of music. Here's every single cue. This one's going to be 17 seconds long, etc. Before you really even get into the game and the game is playable, you got to leave some, at least some TBDs in there so that as, you're, as the game is taking shape, you can, you can adapt to it. And of course, we used a, a wonderful live choir from L.A. The environment flow, basically you start off in Athens, which is a more real-world environment where we have more orchestral, conventional sounds. And then you flow to a more fantasy environment in Pandora. And David Jaffe had a wonderful suggestion for this that, again, was received kind of controversially among a number of people, but ended up working great, as you can imagine. Here's the Greek, and I'll tell more about that in a bit. Here's the uh, Greek text that we used to score the choir. It's the uh, Ode to Ares, God of War, by Hesiod. 
and it's essentially all Greek to me. I don't know if, uh, sorry, sorry. Uh, and, and, and there it is. And while you guys, if you want to kind of read it, I'll play uh, an excerpt of the choir down in L.A. James T. Sale uh, arranged this and conducted it. also serve as a demonstration of that was the main theme of the game. Uh, actually, the person who wrote that main theme is Gerard Marino, uh, one of the two principal composers. He, he, <coughs> uh, he, he created a lot of the uh, uh, thematic uh, pieces for the game, including the other theme for Kratos with a more sort of angry motif that, that gets used a fair amount. Mike Regan, our other principal composer, came aboard and really helped shape the sound of the product. I mean, he, he had a lot of really environmental and intense uh, percussive and primal sounds, and, and it, it really helped to define the world. Uh, additionally, we had Ron Fish, on, uh, who, who really defined the sound of Pandora and, and just brought Pandora to life. Uh, with a huge theme that he had done for the, the trailer almost a year earlier that Chuck mentioned that ended up working great in, as the, the theme for Pandora. Uh, Winifred Phillips did really beautiful ambient stuff. She, she uses her voice and, and multi-tracks her voice and uh, creates these very beautiful in-tune vocal textures all on her own. And she created a lot of the uh, uh, sort of atmospheric ambience that you hear um, from time to time. Uh, between the, the larger action pieces. Uh, Chris Velasco um, created uh, some really catchy and, and driving uh, choral pieces that um, had driving rhythms and really good, great writing for the, cor uh, for the, for the choir and, and uh, very thematic writing. Marcello Di Francisi, interestingly, he had one spec demo from the very beginning of the project. The piece was, was great, and it, it, it ended up being purchased and used in the game, and, and it was actually a pretty significant piece in the game, despite that it was just one piece from Marcello. Um, here's some examples of some of the music. Uh, this is that second theme by Gerard that I told you about that's the Kratos sort of sword fighting theme. <laughs> by Mike Regan about uh, these harpies swoop, swooping out of the air and attacking you, so this has got a lot of sort of swoop sounds in it. Here's the theme for Hades by Chris. levels were very, very, uh, you know, basic to most games, um, the action level and the uh, ambient level. Uh, the fast music wasn't even that fast, really. It's not, uh, I'd say the fastest tempo we had uh, wouldn't really even be considered very fast. <laughs> a more driving, primal thing that tended to work really great for Kratos fighting. Additionally, we were able to use a really 
really kind of just light, simple little piece that helped the score breathe, but still provided kind of some tension behind uh, combat. Now here's that piece that David played for us, which is from uh, Flash Gordon by the band Queen. And it was a very interesting discussion that ensued. But working kind of within that style, with synthesizers and pads, and a, a more thematic version of, a, of an ambience like Mike Regan. So the scoring process basically revolved around playing the game constantly. Um, I'd say that was, for me, the most critical aspect of pulling everything together. In addition to working with Chuck, where we would uh, play the game and, and go through our current file set of music, and we would identify what we, uh, what we needed. Um, we would design the cues and uh, direct the composers for new cues. Um, the cues would come in and I would edit them and uh, we, we had about 180 cues in the end that I edited out to being 322 finally for the final game, including things like ending tags. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, the implementation instructions is, was in the form of Excel and uh, it was a real bear of a document. It was huge. And, and this was sent down to Jonathan Hawkins down at, uh, at Santa Monica Studio. And, uh, ooh, hello, there's my GDC schedule. Okay. Uh, <laughs> GDC, God of War panel. Uh, so this is it. I mean, it just, I'm just going to go ahead and just kind of scroll down. You can see, like, on the left, the location in the game. At start of cutscene of soldiers behind gate shouting, start, and then there's the queue, and then maybe uh, some remarks and some extra instructions. And... This thing uh, just goes on and on and on, and uh, it's, it's basically just a linear um, cue sheet that expresses how the music should all fit together. One thing to notice is that you see this here, start at 17 seconds. What that means is it's a delay call, meaning at the same time that we're doing the thing above, start this other piece, but delay its actual start for 17 seconds, and I'll show you what, why, how that works in a sec. Basically, it's, it's a way to link pieces together linearly. Um, obviously, we deliver the files and work very uh, intensively with, with, with Jonathan. He would work with Maya emitters and AI states to score the game. This is uh, my whiteboard after uh, late night. What, what that is is Pandora level four. And it, it actually expresses the gameplay. You see little ladders and little cranes and little cave entrances. And basically, it, it, it maps out the entire level so that I uh, could speak intelligently about you know, how the music should all work. Um, the adaptive techniques were, were very, very simple. Um, we had one that was multi-track, four-channel uh, mixes where the uh, if, if you will, the upper stereo track would be muted and the piece of music would be more relaxed and then in code, in runtime, when the action would heat up, that second submix, tra submix track would fade up and you'd have the entire piece of music and it would be in a much more intense um, format. The second main technique we did is, is age-old just branching with, uh, with, with crossfades and the cool thing here is we had these ending tags that that basically I edited and, and they would cut in whenever the call would come in to, to uh, you know, the, the last creature killed or whatever, and there'd be a delay call that started the next piece. Here's an illustration of the multi-track submix method. Um, here it's more relaxed. Here it made up. Thank you. 
Um, ending tags. Last example here is the uh, ending tag joining to uh, uh, the next piece. Um, that's just an edit in Pro Tools. That green piece at the top goes on for two minutes. Uh, here's the <laughs> Simple technique, but it, it worked, and uh, it was a wonderful privilege to be able to work on such a great title. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, so we're going to talk about the other side to the project, which was the sound design, the dialogue, and the post-production. Um, so quick overview. So we're going to talk about the audio team, some of the tools and technology that Brad Aldridge is going to talk about, as well as the sound design. Brad was the uh, lead sound designer on the project. Uh, talk about the dialogue, post-production, and finally, the game mix. So the 109 level wads, um, essentially what this meant was each section of the game had it, its own wad area and we had to figure out how we got all the right data in, the right wad for the right moment to make it a seamless world as it transversed from one area to the other. There were no loads in the game as such. Um, the team kept cutting up the game but every, every few days it seemed like and Brad who did a great job on staying on top of those changes, but it was a, a massive amount of work for him. Uh, we had ambiences, localized emitters, of course, 52 individual creatures, the hero, magic, and weapons, 177 movies in the game. Um, we're including, including the MPEGs, the Seymour Logic movies were the backstory movies, and then 114 scripted sequences. Lots of dialogue. And just when we thought the game was done, we ended up working on the marketing initiative, which included telephone messages, uh, Dave Jaffe, the, the game designer, as well as Kratos, and then trailers, the website. It just seemed to go on and on and on. Uh, having said that, it all helped to add to the momentum of the game. We also ended up localizing into six languages. So we ended up with quite a large team from our side. There were four senior sound designers working on the project at the end. Uh, Brad was on for the longest, he was on for about 18 months and then for the last maybe five or six months we started to really ramp it up. A lot of the things that were going so well early on started changing quickly. We started to get feedback towards the end, it got chaotic to the point where we were scoring the game as much as Clint was with the music, we were trying to stay on top of all these changes and, and make sure it sounded good and the elements all sat together. We also ended up having not enough time to cover everything. We ended up hiring external resources, uh, Technicolor, uh, Phil Kovacs uh, helped us and jumped in with Creature Sounds, which was a huge bonus to us. Um, we ended up having two post-cinematic production 
guys working on that, as well as using the external resources. Two full-time audio implementers, that was uh, Jonathan Hawkins, uh, who was also doing music. He also did a lot of the um, spot emitters. We also had uh, Jason McDonald, who helped us in the end as well. Those guys nearly killed themselves. Um, but without them, and they were a great feedback channel for us for information, because they were in the, on the shop floor in the middle of, the, of this hell that was going on. Um, we also had a dialogue coordinator, which ended up being me, and uh, an audio programmer who was smart enough to make everything data-driven so he wasn't killed at the end. With that, I'm going to hand it off to Brad. Okay, uh, for tools and technology, we used our Sony Scream audio tool. And uh, one of the really great things about using that uh, was having the ability to control all of the audio streams in the game, whether they were music, um, sound effects, or streaming uh, vocalizations out of IOP memory, all of those were done uh, from the bank itself, uh, which was really very convenient. Um, previously on any project I'd worked on, the extent of um, you know, the, the streams was handing off files to the programmer and saying, you know, play this. So having the ability to control the volume, uh, we could randomize streams. Um, we could actually randomize pitch on the streams. We had a lot of things we could do with them, and um, it really helped out, especially in the mix process. <coughs> we also uh, used uh, Maya for placing emitters and, um, and uh, crossfade zones, which I'll get to in a minute here. We did use all of our SPU RAM, um, as tends to happen on these projects. We have eight buffers. The system was actually smart enough where um, we, could, we could pretty much utilize the buffers however we needed to, but we, we uh, dedicated four for music and four for ambience, so we could have um, cross-fading ambiences. We used one meg of IOP RAM where... Um, we had 100K for uh, Kratos vocalizations, for his combat vocalizations, um, getting hit and jumping around and um, little attack sounds. And then 100K for each creature, one of four, that we could load. This is a page from our audio design document, kind of explaining um, what we were loading into SVU RAM and the order. And a couple things to note here. Number one, the size of our uh, streaming buffers was 8K, um, which for me uh, was great. I mean, any, any project I'd worked on before this, you know, we always had to devote like these 64K buffers and S SPU RAM for, um, for streaming buffers. So that was huge to be able to get those um, streaming buffers down to 8K. We did that by um, using um, larger buffers in IOP in conjunction. So we had um, four enemy banks loaded. Each of those was, were 110K. So each enemy was 110K of SPU RAM and 100K of uh, IOP vocalizations. We had two level banks loaded at any given time. Each of those were 200K. So the meat and potatoes of this game, Kratos, Creatures, Ambiences, and Level Sounds, that was pretty much all the sound design. Um, I'm going to touch a little bit on each of those and also talk about a couple things we did with Scream that were, uh, that were pretty cool. So, um, I don't have my mouse up here. Uh, this is all, you're not going to hear it, this is all getting off your sound card. Uh-oh. Do you know who? Jesus, I can't. Oh, great. Seconds to see if it'll play. Right. You turn it up just to... We tested this once before. 
You did. <laughs> it worked, really. Oh, goodness. Excuse the me internal speakers work? Well, go, go old school, man. Go old school with the speakers. Do we have time to do a quick restart? Why not? Take some time. Yeah. Yeah. Does anybody have any questions about the music? Yes. Only one, my friend. Uh, you could also from that from the website from we we did a promotion with Sony Connect right so if you bought the game you got a chance to download the soundtrack but it was also available for purchase. Yeah, it's it's sort of like Sony's iTunes and it's about nine ninety nine I think for the whole record. Uh, it, it, it's PC though it does it does uh, it's not compatible with Mac. Um, I think that that's one of the things that was so powerful for us is that while it was chaotic and stressful to be, uh, you know, uh, you know, basically developing the music right along with the latter stages of game development, it did give us the luxury of of uh, of scoring a game that was more mature and more playable. Um, I think the lesson that we learned there is you don't want to go on either extreme. You don't want to leave everything open ended. You also don't want to lock in on a cue list at the very outset of your project. Uh, you want to strike a balance, and the way that we're addressing that is by locking down things that you can lock down, but then also inserting TBDs, one minute, one and a half minutes, two minutes. It's a way to placehold from a cost standpoint, and it's a way to placehold from a scope of work when talking to composers. Any other? How's the how's going? Slow. Okay. Any other questions on music or what you've seen so far with sound? With the soundtrack to Hellbound Hellraiser 2, one of the uh, inspirational source materials for anyone. No. It's an interesting listen. Yeah. Hellraiser 2? Hellbound Hellraiser 2. Uh, Christopher Young. Christopher Young is talented. Anything else? Yes. Right. No, that's another great question. Uh, we actually didn't know, of course, when the Hydra would be killed. Uh, and we also didn't know what bar or beat we were in. <laughs> so uh, we relied on crossfading um, as being one way to smooth out the transition. Uh, a second thing that we relied on was, I guess you could sort of call luck, in that a lot of the time when this ending tag would crossfade in, musically, it would sound fine. Uh, the third thing that we would rely upon is the very real possibility that the Hydra is shrieking, uh, giving his death shriek at that moment as well. So, like I say, you know, like Chuck and I said, there were certain aspects of what we did that were somewhat low tech and, and um, seemingly almost in sync with the kind of primal nature of the very game itself, subject wise. And, and, and it was really so much about the music and what music was playing when. And transitions were attended to, and, and uh, for the most part, they're, they're pretty good. But yes, they're not, they're not sophisticated. There's not bar and beat uh, knowledge and all that. Yes? How much in-house remastering do you have to do? Check one. Versus, uh, I, I, that's a great question. Um, we, at long last, figured uh, uh, developed a, a, an L1 setting of minus 17 dB. I'm kidding. Uh, <laughs> no, uh, 
I got to say, I got to say, everyone, the music is, for orchestral music, it's, it's pretty, pretty hard compressed. It, the waveforms do not look like what orchestral music typically looks like. And uh, it just ended up being, along with what Dave's group accomplished in the sound area, just the way to score the game. It also tended to work really well over television speakers. And uh, as, as Chuck said, Dave Jaffe really wanted everything at 11, and he got it. We also did a lot of remixing of the multi-track sounds. I mean, we spent, and by we, I mean Clint, spent a lot of time really going in there, and we'd, we'd, we'd put a piece of music up against the game, and we'd say, you know what, this would work great, but we've got to rip out that percussion part, or we've got to make that horn part a little less busy. And sometimes we'd go back to the composers, but oftentimes we would just uh, make those changes ourselves in-house, ramp it back into the game. It was, a, it was a really extensive, iterative process, but I, just, I think that attention to detail ends up, really ends up paying off. That's true. I guess you could say that, that the material would come in, and then right before it got converted to the delivery files and sent, and sent to the team, everything went through this pass of, of, uh, of, being, of being brought into Pro Tools or Peak and edited and, uh, and, and processed, EQ'd, compressed, um, uh, ending tags, fashioned, etc. Sometimes we combine pieces of music, right? Oh, we would combine pieces of music. These six composers were wonderful. You know, they all worked separately uh, with, with us serving as kind of a hub, right, information-wise and everything, but... Uh, their material just worked together in a really great way. And we're, we, we at Sony, perhaps somewhat unusual uh, compared with other, other companies, uh, we're not afraid at all of, of having multiple composers. And in fact, we, uh, we derive great benefit from bringing in different voices and coordinating them and making them work together. Did you say peak? Peak, yes. Yeah, oh, there you go. Hey. <laughs> Uh, any other questions? Yeah, I believe it was, it was already mentioned that uh, that you guys had sort of a, a random approach to loading the music, um, or at least you would load like on the spot. Was that? I mean, according to your cues up there, you had you would start all four pieces maybe simultaneously and then crossfade in, at, so they would be beat aligned accordingly. That, that's right. And in okay. fact, the proprietary file format actually interleaves those uh, two stereo uh, tracks. Yes. Oh, oh. oh no! Right. Is it that? The blades of chaos. <laughs> yeah. Oh. That was the sound for this sound. <laughs> um, well, we, can we can press on with no. With no of course, it looks like the examples we won't be able to play inside. Right. Okay, so there's a bunch of cool sounds in this game <laughs> that I was gonna play. Um, so. All right, I'll just talk a little bit about, um, how many of you are familiar with the game of Plated? Okay, well, um, you know his main weapon were the, were the chains, the swords on, on the chains. And uh, something, uh, it was a lot of fun to kind of come up with those sounds. Um, I tried to be very literal at first and got a bunch of chains of different sizes and, and, um, and um, thicknesses and was I was swinging those around and for a while, and I quickly figured out that swinging chains around doesn't really make a whole lot of noise. <laughs> so, yeah. So I mean, I tried all kinds of different things. I mean, I experimented for quite a while. I ended up actually manufacturing the sounds by um, just sequencing together very small bits of um, clanks and and um, chain hits. So uh, that was fun. So he had all these magic sounds um, that that were also uh, a part of the game, and uh, not only did he have these magic sounds, but each one of them had anywhere from three to five upgrades that you could do as well. So one of the big uh, challenges was was trying to fit all of this in memory. We weren't doing any kind of dynamic loading, so that was um, was definitely a challenge. Uh, of course, we had to do our ham beating fest. You know, with a game like this, you can't get by without recording, you know, the beating of a ham. <laughs> and melons and, uh, you know, all kinds of stuff. It was great. Our studio smelled like meat for three days. Um, so, as we discussed, there were, um, we were able to load four creatures at any one time. 
And um, that's not to say that we couldn't have multiple versions of each creature type. So I found that out the hard way. What I was really originally trying to do was, was make a whole lot of little random sounds per creature. I didn't want any kind of repetitive sound happening. Um, but when you get, you know, four versions of, of, you know, say if you've got a Medusa, a Cyclops, and um, two different skelly types all in the, the level at the same time, and then there's, you know, four of each of those, you got, you know, these 12 creatures running around, or 16, and that just made for a lot of noise, a lot of uh, confusion, really. So we ended up kind of late in the process, um, really paring those sounds down and, and creating signature sounds um, that Dave Jaffe wanted to try to accomplish. So there were really just a few sounds per creature that um, that you really wanted the player to be able to identify with that creature and specific emphasis on a pre-attack sounds so that when you heard certain sounds, you knew you were supposed to block or roll or get out of the way. And then, uh, again... These were really cool sounds that I would have played for you. <laughs> um, oh, a couple things um, here. The, the Hydra, I just wanted to point out, this is kind of an interesting thing. Um, Phil Kovats did a wonderful job, as Dave was saying, with a lot of the creature sounds. And we had to do like, um, I don't know, ten revisions of the Hydra sounds, at least. I mean, we went through a lot. Dave Jaffe we just had a real specific thing that he wanted to hear. And... Um, so we did all these revisions, and it ended up actually um, the, the winning the winning sound had the the, uh, the secret ingredient was um, the espresso machine steamer, you know, the milk steamer. We added that in with um, you know the the uh, the hydro screams, and that was it. That's Dave Jaffe. Was, that's it. So <laughs> you never know when your coffee maker is going to come in handy with sounds. All right, so we had the usual um, assortment of, you know, level emitters. We had plenty of those, and um, it was a full-time job for Jonathan Hawkins and Jason McDonald to keep on top of all those changes that were happening. Um, one really cool thing, I mentioned we are streaming ambiences for this game. We created n about 90 three-minute ambiences, so um, it was, it was, that was a lot of fun. It was great. It allowed us to, uh, to really have some rich textures in the game. The, the main problem was how to go from area to area and have these crossfades, uh, have these uh, ambiences smoothly crossfade. Since everything was data-driven, um, we, we controlled the streams from the bank, as I was saying, and the streams were actually triggered out of emitters in the level world, and typically the, you know, the, the Maya emitters were spheres, so um, that didn't really blend well when trying to, to have a, you know, when you have a very non-geometrical game world, you know. So we had to come up with... Um, what we call the crossfade zone, which basically allowed us to uh, fade between two sound IDs um, along a straight path. And it was cool. It wasn't necessarily limited to like a hallway where, you know, you're at one end of the hallway. It, it, it didn't matter. Like th th this example I was going to show you uh, was of a cliff that uh, Kratos had to go up. So he traverses back and forth these stairs up and uh, all the way up to the top of the cliff, and, and it was a very nice, smooth transition because they placed one of these crossfade zones across the whole cliff. Um, so that was cool and uh, really helped to, to make things pretty smooth. Also, when we didn't want to have just a straight transition, the, the thing about the crossfade zone, which was clutch, was the ability to change the direction we could fade. Um, we could, you know, fade in, in pretty much any direction we wanted to. So that was... Um, extremely helpful for doing things like going around corners and, and um, other things of that nature. Again, here is a movie that I could play, but I won't because there's no sound. And another movie of in-game footage that you guys have all seen because you've all played the game. And there you go. <laughs> um, a couple things about Scream that I can touch on that we're, we're able to do. We're using... Um, we used uh, global registers uh, in Scream. Basically, a register is just a, a way to pass data from the game to the sound bank so that, uh, depending on game states, we can change, modify the sound, um, and do any number of things, really. A couple of examples of that, for example, the uh, footsteps. There was a uh, master footstep ID that was triggered for each surface type for Kratos. Uh, when that ID was triggered, it was also um, a data, um, I mean, a value was sent with that sound call 
which corresponded to the exact type of animation that Kratos was doing, whether he was walking, running, jumping, um, or, uh, let's see, you know, walking very slowly, stepping. So um, the, the sound ID would then interp interpret that uh, value and play the, the appropriate sound. So that was uh, kind of cool, all that stuff going on without the programmer really knowing about it. So uh, another very cool example of using global registers was um, kind of a pseudo occlusion, we call it. Um, there is this movie of Kratos where he's behind his door. We hear muffled sounds of screaming and chaos on the other side of the door. Um, what we wanted to do is when he kicks it open, which he's about to do, we wanted to turn off those uh, muffled sounds and play the direct source. Um, so we were able to do that with uh, global registers. I thought I heard something there for a second. Sounds like it's working. How do we... Uh, see? Well, anyway. That's good. We've got to kind of move on anyway, so... We're uh, okay. I'm going to hand it back to Dave to talk about dialogue and mixing. Thanks, Brad. Um, so I want to make sure we've got plenty of QA time. So I'm going to zip through the rest of this. So for the dialogue, um, we had some great performances. Dave was, again, very instrumental in wanting uh, the right dialogue, the right performances. We went back and did many pickup sessions until we got the exact performance we needed. Um, which was great, but it also took us up very, very close to the end of the project doing pickups, which was chaotic. But I think it showed the value in doing that because it was right. Uh, most of the dialogue was in cinematics. Um, as I said, we did lots of revisions. Uh, there was a lot of usage for marketing. Uh, one of the opportunities we felt we missed, and uh, Brad was thinking about it towards the end, was more worldizing the dialogue, make sure it fit in the environment because there were lots of opportunities where it was just in that particular space that line happened um, and unfortunately just as we were about to jump on that they took the game away from us so uh, we had uh, Linda Hunt do the narrator T.C. Carson was Kratos great voices really appropriate to the characters in fact you know T.C. Carson's voice defined Kratos in many ways post-production um, we had some, a great team working on the post-production. Uh, Mike Johnson, who's our post-production manager. Mark Reese who also was, uh, did a stellar job on the movies. Um, there were a lot of movies, a lot of them coming in very late. Um, we just had to try and stay on top of them. I think in the end it worked out great. The Foley, we did a lot of Foley for the movies. Um, we started also... In the end, on the Semologic movies, which were the, the short story ones, uh, Technicolor helped us out with those again, again, because we were simply out of time. Um, I would play you a movie, but I can't. So I'm going to talk about the game mix. So the game mix, everything's at 10, wherever happens a dynamic range. Um, Chuck and Clint both talked about this B-movie philosophy. And I think for all of us here in that, it was just like the light switching on. We knew it was, it was balls to the wall. Everything had to be going. But with that, we also had to make sure that elements had their space in the mix. Uh, music, sound effects, and ambiences. It was, everything was so big and so bold. Trying to find a, a, a place where everything could sit and weave was, was a, a big task for us. Um, we, had, um, we had to mix on TV as well as surround. We were doing this a lot. And that last week of the mix that we did, the game, probably 90% of that was on the TV. We also checked it on surround and bounced back. But because we, were, we wanted it to really stand out on the TV for most consumers, that was our principal focus. Uh, one of the things that really helped us is we have this concept of user groups, essentially submixes. We could submix things and what we would do is we would balance within that group and then balance those groups. Pretty obvious but very, very much a time saver. Reverb, we were able to tweak all of the reverb on the fly. Uh, ducking from within screen. So what we would do is we would have this moment where maybe you're exploring. You'd hear the ambience. It'd be a, an ambient piece of music. You'd hear the, the footsteps of Kratos. But then you get into this 
huge event where the battle breaks out. At which point we wanted, we, we didn't want just the battle music and the ambience and all the effects to fight with each other. So what we would do, very simply, was say, okay, when this piece of music starts, duck the ambience out. Let's just get rid of it. And also what we would do is that for the particular moves that Kratos pulled off, we wanted to really highlight those and try and make them stand out on their own. So, for example, when Kratos grabs one of the skellies and rips them in half, what you don't hear is we're actually ducking a lot of things at that moment to really make that stand out, because that's the most important thing you care about at that time. Game premix took about three weeks with one killer final week. Uh, I mean, it wasn't just, it wasn't just all night. It was, a, it was an all week. It was a killer. It was a real... It was death march. And we were all there. We were all up in Santa Monica. All, we were editing stuff. We were editing sound effects. We were, there was so much going on. And I, I remember we were supposed to be finished on the Friday. I remember having a meeting on the Wednesday before that Friday where they showed me a new part of the level they just designed and implemented. And we were like, holy crap, what are we doing with this? And we had to, we had to finish that and get it mixed and get that into it. Um, for mix, this was Force Reloader Banks. We had this principle where we could, in Scream, you know, we might see something that needs fixing. We could go into Scream and then we could reforce load the, all the banks at that time. The beauty of that was we could fix something, force the reload, and we could carry on playing. So we could change and fix things straight away rather than waiting to, to, to reload the game, get all the way to that point and go, uh, it's still not right. That was a huge benefit. That probably saved us a couple of weeks right there. And uh, Phil Wilkins was the audio programmer. He gave us a great debug system, without which, again, we wouldn't have had the information to make the changes. As Brad alluded to, we, we ended up doing a, having a huge soundscape that we ended up filtering a lot of stuff out by saying, okay, that's extraneous, remove it. What are the key elements? You know, you've got to remember, we've got a, a rich musical score, you know, big sound effects, Kratos was bigger than life, and then trying to mix all these together so that they worked. And I think in the end, it, it worked out, but without the tool set, we couldn't have done what we did. So, that's it. q &A. Typically, I mean, we try to make it longer than shorter. You know, we don't want anything too jarring. But yeah, you could just you could just adjust the size of the zone um, and, and rebuild the lawn, and, uh, and you'd be able to hear that that change pretty quickly. A lot of it was trial and error in that you know the, the guys, the implementers, would do a first pass of that, and they would try and get that right and tweak it, and then you know we'd give them extra notes after that. But they took the first pass at everything. Congratulate you guys on actually getting an honest to God audio puzzle actually into the game. Um, when they told when they told me the sirens, I had to find them. I thought probably not, but I'm going to put those back speakers up and turn them on just in case. I'm sure enough. Uh, you mentioned you had a uh, sort of semi-real-time uh, mixing environment with the force reload of banks and so on and so forth. But um, was it? Did you guys bring the idea up of potentially having a total real-time solution at the beginning of the project or early on in the project, in which you could say, okay, if we need something changed in terms of a volume or in conjunction with Scream, we can just automatically do it within the game environment and then save it out and then just it'll go into the build. Um, to answer that, I think we. There were definitely things we went into needing. Um, there was also the code base for this had, had some legacy um, where they already had a debug system from a previous project. But what we started to see as we went through it uh, was, you know, as the worlds got bigger and we could, we just couldn't handle being able to change something and have to uh, go back to starting that wad or that level to get through it. 
So some of the things definitely came online later. I mean, one of the things we had, I talked about the user groups. We could tweak all of those in real time in the game and hear the changes. We also had the ability to save that mix. So we could just go into our debug menu, hit save mix, and it generates an XML file, which we could then check in. So then the, the team would hear those changes. So there was, there was a lot of cool things that we did. Some of the things we didn't find out until really late in the day were things like we could have the game in slow motion and, and see the get, you know, actually watch the, through the list as it created the sounds, as it generated them. We could go, oh, that's the one that's killing us. Let's, you know, whereas the action would be so fast we couldn't necessarily see or hear stuff. But in answer, it was a, an evolutionary process. Um, we couldn't hear the creature sounds, but I was wondering how much of the sounds were actually uh, were built from uh, sound banks and how much were actually made out, uh, made from scratch? Well, um, we'd have to ask Phil Kovacs that, actually. Um, he did a lot of the creature sounds. Of the, he's here with us. Phil, <laughs> take a stand. Um, for the creatures that I worked on, um, most of them were... Uh, a pretty good combination of, of, of VO recording and um, layered with, with different um, field recordings of animals or library sounds. So, Phil, would you have anything to add to that? Well, as, as, as far as the creature sounds, that uh, when I was working at Technicolor at the time, um, Technicolor has, as an outsourcing, has an extensive, like, two terabyte library. <laughs> of stuff that goes back 25 years to like Raiders of the Lost Ark, Gremlins, Fifth Element, you name it. They've done a lot of it. And so we had a lot of really good material to pull from, including stuff like, you know, a weird espresso steam screen or um, what was something else? Uh, horse breeding. Um, <laughs> a, uh, a goat being eaten by a Komodo dragon. Um, a lot of things like that, which we could we could really layer some some interesting things on. So, yeah. it's a horrible sound, <laughs> but it worked for this game. Um, so, a lot of the stuff was built um, that that I created was built as source that Brad could then tear apart and use in the game as necessary could ever work for that scene. So. Do you guys know uh, what percentage of the budget audio, music, VO got, you know, compared to the overall project budget? I mean, is it the usual this much? Or did you, do you guys feel that you were really, uh, you know, you were empowered by the budget? The, 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 yeah, the, the team did a great job of giving us the resources that we needed. I mean, not only not only the money, but the, the bandwidth of, uh, of the programmers and the, I mean, they, they were very supportive, and, and, and it shows, I mean, because that's, that was the only way we could get the, you know, the quality <clears throat> that we got. Yeah. I'd rather not. You, you know, just to add to that, that you know, as Chuck said, we, this was a flagship project, and we all knew there was some stage where we went, holy crap, this is a great game. This is going to be stellar. The team knew it, and they pulled all the stops out, and, you know, um, we had stuff we wanted to do, our demands to make it as good as it could be. And so uh, they stepped up to the plate and yeah. gave us it. And not just in terms of cash, but in terms of personnel to actually implement this stuff. Having two full-time implementers, an audio programmer, you know, was great for us. Yeah, I mean, we didn't have a blank check. I mean, we had to work within a budget, but they were, they were very supportive of you know, what we wanted to do. We spent more on other games. How's that? Are you? <laughs> with with just the music or with the whole game? Um, you know what we were doing as as we went through it. You know, we really were trying to. We were all trying to score the game. So, 
Um, if you look at those debug menus, you'll see everything is 1024. Everything is at 11, you know. But what we tried to do as we went through, we were sensitive to each scene and really having that ability to tweak in, you know, the screen, in screen, the streams, um, gave us that ability to just go, okay, you know, we're, we're going to balance and we've just got to keep it here. We had our TV and our surround system set at a particular point and we just left it there. And that's what really helped us just balance it knowing as we went through it. One thing I think might be uh, interesting about <coughs> the mix is uh, not unlike the way John Williams' orchestral score in, in the original Star Wars movie was uh, filtered and uh, the low end really drastically reduced. If you listen to just the music um, from Star Wars Episode Four, uh, it almost sounds trebly and kind of even tinny um, in line, at, but in order to work with the overall soundtrack. Uh, in line with that, one of the last things that we did is a batch process on the music with a somewhat traumatic um, high pass filter with a roll off. Uh, that you really, that, that was kind of astonishing actually, but when you put it in the game, um, it just brought the game to everything into focus. And, and it just goes to show, once again, that it's not about any one element, it's not about, uh, you know, it, it's, it's really about the whole. Yeah, just to, to add to that, because one of the issues we run into was so much sound, it was nothing had its own space, the, the, the combat music was very rich and full, and, it, and you know, as Clint said, we ended up having to look at each element and try and see if we could find a space for it. Uh, and that was true across the board, pretty much. Did you face any restrictions in terms of loading from in and out to the streaming world? Uh, sounds stored in IOP RAM, restrictions that you didn't face on sounds that were in S RAM. Did you have to handle them differently? Um, not really. We had um, we had fixed allocations in IOP of, in chunks. So um, as long as what we were loading in wasn't you know didn't exceed that memory size, um, it wasn't an issue at all. So and and, and SRAM worked the same way. So. So you, you didn't do um, dynamic RAM loading and uh, defragging on the fly. No. No, we, we did load in as in, as you went from a different ward, we were filling those slots. Right. But really, we weren't defrag. It, it was all, once it was allocated, we were just loading across it. Yeah, and, and there really wasn't um, any, any space left over. I mean, we, we really did maximize pretty much everywhere and anywhere we could to, to, to utilize every byte that we could. So, uh, you know, even, even if uh, there were a couple say, IOP uh, creatures that were a little less intensive on their IOP vocalizations, um, you know, that didn't happen very often. But, um, you know, once they were unloaded, it, it left the same amount of space, let's say, for the next creature that was about to load in. So we didn't ever have any uh, troubles with that. Okay. Well, I think we're out of time, so uh, we'll see you at the bar. <laughs>